Hello everyone, thank you for tuning in to Let's Talk, where every topic worth discussing becomes a conversation. I'm your host, Shayna Pierre. Today's conversation will focus on school shootings. The stain of gun violence runs deep in America. It's a grim reality that we've become sadly all too familiar with. But there's one type of gun violence, one type of tragedy that seems to cut even deeper, shaking us to our core each and every time, school shootings. These aren't just statistics. These are the sons and daughters of our neighbors, our friends, our communities. In the past two decades, the United States has witnessed numerous tragic school shootings. These horrific acts of violence have left a trail of grief and heartbreak across the nation, raising urgent questions about the root causes and potential solutions. Today we remember the victims and grapple with the challenges of these tragedies. We'll examine the profiles of the perpetrators and the circumstances surrounding each incident, looking for common threads and potential warning signs. This is a difficult and sensitive subject and there are no easy answers. But by shedding light on these tragedies, we hope to contribute to a larger conversation about mental health, gun control, and the safety of our schools. It's a conversation that we, as a nation, can no longer afford to ignore. We owe it to the victims, their families, and ourselves to try to understand how we got here and what we can do to prevent future tragedies. March 21st, 2005 started like any other day at Red Lake Senior High School in Minnesota. Students and faculty went about their daily routines unaware of the darkness that would soon envelop their small community. But for 16-year-old Jeffrey Wise, a student at the school, this day was different. Haunted by a troubled home life, a history of bullying, and battling severe depression, Weiss was about to unleash unimaginable horror. Armed with a handgun and a shotgun, Weiss first took the lives of his grandfather and his grandfather's girlfriend at their home. Then he drove to the school, a place that for him had become synonymous with his pain. Entering the building, Weiss shot an unarmed security guard and then turned his weapon on students and staff, ultimately killing nine people and injuring several others before taking his own life. The Red Lake Massacre sent shockwaves through the nation. How could a 16-year-old boy living in a tight-knit community commit such a heinous act? The investigation revealed a deeply troubled young man grappling with mental health issues and a sense of isolation. Wiser had previously been treated for depression and had expressed suicidal thoughts. The tragedy at Red Lake highlighted the devastating consequences of untreated mental health issues, particularly in young people. It also shows the need for greater awareness and support systems within schools and communities to identify and help those struggling with mental illness. The question remained, however, could anything have been done to prevent this tragedy, or was it, as some argued, an unpreventable act of a deeply disturbed individual? The serenity of Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, known for its rolling hills and Amish communities, was shattered on October 2nd, 2006. A seemingly ordinary milk truck driver, 32-year-old Charles Carl Roberts IV, drove to the West Nickel Mines School, a one-room Amish schoolhouse. Armed with an arsenal that included a handgun, a shotgun, and a stun gun, Roberts was about to commit an act of unspeakable cruelty. Barricading himself inside the schoolhouse with 10 young girls and their teacher, Roberts released the adults and the boys in the class. He then tied up the remaining girls and proceeded to shoot them execution style, taking the lives of five innocent children before turning the gun on himself as authorities closed in. 
The community was left reeling, struggling to comprehend the senseless violence that had invaded their peaceful world. Unlike many school shooters, Roberts had no apparent connection to the school. He was not a former student and none of the victims were known to him. In a chilling note left behind, Roberts claimed to be seeking revenge for a perceived wrong that had occurred 20 years prior. He wrote of harboring anger and resentment stemming from the death of his premature daughter and alluded to having molested children in the past. The West Nickel Mine shooting shocked the nation with its brutality and the seemingly random nature of the attack. It raised troubling questions about the accessibility of firearms, the potential for violence from seemingly ordinary individuals, and the devastating impact of unresolved trauma and resentment. It forced a nation to confront the uncomfortable reality that even in the most tranquil of settings, evil could lurk, waiting for an opportunity to strike. It's difficult to comprehend the sheer scale of the tragedy that unfolded on April 16, 2007 at Virginia Tech. A seemingly ordinary day on a bustling college campus transformed into a scene of unimaginable horror. It's a day forever etched in our collective memory. Sung Hui Cho, a 23-year-old senior at the university, went on a shooting rampage that claimed the lives of 32 people, making it, at the time, the deadliest school shooting in U.S. history. The echo of gunfire shattered the tranquility of this esteemed institution, leaving a community reeling in shock and grief. The incident sparked nationwide debates about gun control, mental health, and campus security. How could Sheng Hui Cho harbor such darkness, such rage, and carry out such a horrific act? These questions weighed heavily on the minds of investigators, policymakers, and the American public alike. The Virginia Tech massacre forced us to confront uncomfortable truths about the vulnerabilities of our education system and the desperate need for a deeper understanding of mental health issues. Less than a year after the Virginia Tech tragedy, the nation found itself grappling with yet another senseless act of violence on a college campus. On February 14, 2008, the familiar sound of gunfire pierced the halls of Northern Illinois University, leaving five students dead and 17 others injured. The gunman, 27-year-old Steven Kazmierczak, was a former student at the university. He had a history of mental health struggles, but was not known to be violent. This tragedy affirms the unpredictable nature of such events and the challenges in identifying individuals who might pose a threat. The shooting at Northern Illinois University reopened the still raw wounds of Virginia Tech, igniting renewed calls for gun control measures and increased mental health resources for students. The back-to-back -back tragedies left many questioning the safety of our nation's college campuses. The incident highlighted that the issue of school shootings transcended geographic boundaries and demographics. On a cold February morning in 2012, the peaceful routine of Chardon High School in Ohio was shattered by the sound of gunfire. 17-year-old TJ Lane opened fire in the school cafeteria, a place typically filled with laughter and conversation. Three students lost their lives that day, their futures tragically cut short. Lane's motive remained largely a mystery, adding to the anguish and confusion surrounding the event. He had a history of behavioral issues and came from an abusive home environment, factors that likely contributed to his downward spiral. The Chardon High School shooting once again proved that the threat of gun violence extended beyond college campuses, reaching into the heart of our nation's high schools, 
it reignited the debate about how to protect our children, how to identify warning signs, and how to prevent such tragedies from happening again. In the wake of Chardon, communities across the country grappled with the same questions. How could we make our schools safer? How could we better address mental health issues among young people? The search for solutions became ever more urgent as the nation mourned yet another senseless loss of life, of The nation was once again confronted with the horror of a school shooting on December 14, 2012. This time, it was the unthinkable, the unimaginable in elementary school. Sandy Hook Elementary in Newtown, Connecticut became synonymous with tragedy. 20-year-old Adam Lanza, armed with firearms purchased by his mother, entered the school that morning and opened fire. The details even now are difficult to recount. 20 children, all between the ages of six and seven, were killed. Six adult staff members also lost their lives trying to protect the children entrusted to their care. Lanza, who had a history of mental health issues, took his own life after the massacre. The community of Newtown, and indeed the entire country, was left reeling in the aftermath. The question of how such a horrific act could happen, particularly in a place meant for learning and innocence, became a central focus of national debate. And the Sandy Hook shooting sparked renewed calls for gun control and increased mental health resources. But the path forward remained and remains complex and fraught with deep divisions. On June 10, 2014, tragedy struck Reynolds High School in Troutdale, Oregon. It was a day that began like any other filled with the routine of school life, but it would end in gunfire and a loss of life. 15-year-old freshman Jared Michael Paget entered the school armed with a rifle. Paget, reportedly fueled by an admiration for past school shooters, opened fire, taking the life of 14-year-old Emilio Hoffman. In a confrontation with responding police officers, Paget was shot and killed. The community was left grappling with the sudden and senseless loss of a young life. The shooting at Reynolds High School, while not on the scale of some other tragedies, highlighted the vulnerability of schools and the far-reaching impact of gun violence. The incident reignited discussions about school safety measures, mental health support for teenagers, and the accessibility of firearms, particularly to young people. The search for answers for ways to prevent such tragedies from happening again continued, fueled by the grief and determination of a community forever marked by the events of that day. The small town of Marysville, Washington, was forever changed on October 24, 2014, by a tragic school shooting. At Marysville Pilchuck High School, a place meant for learning and connection, a student named Jalen Freiberg committed an act of unimaginable violence. 15-year-old freshman opened fire in the school cafeteria, targeting a specific group of students. Four students, three of them freshman girls, were killed. Freiberg then turned the gun on himself, ending his own life. The Marysville Pilchuck High School shooting was particularly heartbreaking due to the close relationships between the victims and the shooter. Jalen Freiberg, by all accounts, had been a well-liked and popular student. He was a member of the football team and had recently been crowned homecoming prince. The investigation into the shooting revealed that Freiburg had been struggling with a personal grievance, reportedly stemming from a relationship issue. This tragedy highlighted the urgent need for open communication and mental health support for young people. It was October 1st, 2015, a day that began like any other on the rural campus of Umpqua Community College in Roseburg, Oregon. Students gathered for classes, lost in textbooks, thoughts drifting towards the weekend ahead, 
but that normalcy was shattered by the sound of gunshots echoing through the halls of Snyder Hall. The gunman, 26-year-old Christopher Harper Mercer, moved methodically through classrooms, ultimately taking the lives of nine innocent people and injuring nine others. As law enforcement descended upon the scene, Harper Mercer engaged in a firefight with officers before taking his own life. The tragedy at Umpqua Community College sent shockwaves through the nation, a grim reminder that the scourge of gun violence could strike anywhere, even in a small, tight-knit community like Roseburg. In the aftermath, investigators would uncover details about Harper Mercer's troubled past, his struggles with mental illness, and his chilling fascination with other mass shootings. His online activity revealed a deeply disturbed individual who seemed to idolize those who had committed similar acts of violence. The shooting once again ignited the debate over gun control, mental health, and the societal factors that contribute to these horrific events. But for the families and friends of the victims, the questions would remain a constant ache in their hearts. The idyllic tranquility of Townville, South Carolina, a town where everyone knows their neighbor, was shattered on September 28, 2016. 14-year-old Jesse Osborne, armed with a handgun, opened fire on the playground of Townville Elementary School, forever changing the lives of those present. A six-year-old boy, Jacob Hall, was shot and tragically succumbed to his injuries days later. A teacher and another student were wounded, but survived the attack. The small community used to such violence reeled in shock and grief. How could something like this happen here in their own backyard? As investigators pieced together the events leading up to the shooting, a disturbing picture emerged. Osborne, who had been expelled from the school, had fatally shot his own father at their home before driving to the school. His motive, a twisted desire for notoriety, echoing the actions of other young men who had sought infamy through violence. The shooting at Townville Elementary School, though smaller in scale than some, highlighted that even the youngest and most vulnerable members of our society are not immune to the horrors of gun violence. The incident reignited the debate about school safety, access to firearms, and the desperate need for early intervention when it comes to troubled youth. Valentine's Day, a day typically associated with love and affection, took on a horrifyingly different meaning for the students and staff of Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida on February 14, 2018. At approximately 2.20 p.m., the familiar rhythm of the school day was shattered by the ear-splitting crackle of gunfire. 19-year-old Nicholas Cruz, a former student with a well-documented history of behavioral problems and disturbing social media posts, had returned to the school armed with an AR-15 assault rifle. He stalked the halls of the freshman building, firing indiscriminately, leaving a trail of carnage in his wake. 17 people, 14 students, and three staff members lost their lives that day, forever etching their names in the grim history of school shootings in America. The massacre at Parkland would not only become one of the deadliest school shootings in U.S. history, but also a turning point in the national conversation about gun violence. In the wake of the shooting, the surviving students of Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School refused to be silenced. They emerged as powerful, as Kauf advocates for gun control, organizing rallies, marches, and social media campaigns that resonated across the country and the world. Their message was clear, never again. They demanded action from lawmakers calling for stricter gun laws, improved mental health resources, and an end to the epidemic of gun violence plaguing their generation. It was another seemingly ordinary Friday morning in America. 
Students at Santa Fe High School in Texas were starting their day unaware of the horror that awaited them. Just before eight o'clock in the morning, 17-year-old Dimitrios Pagursis entered the school armed with his father's shotgun and revolver. Pagursis opened fire in an art class, killing two teachers and eight students. 10 others were injured. This horrific act of violence shook the small community of Santa Fe to its core, leaving many searching for answers. The investigation revealed a deeply troubled young man. Pogortzis had been bullied and suffered from depression. In his journals, he expressed admiration for previous school shooters and a desire to be remembered for an act of infamy. This tragedy, like so many before it, raised questions about mental health resources for young people and the role of easy access to firearms. As we grapple with the aftermath of this tragedy, we must ask ourselves how many more innocent lives must be lost before we find a way to stop this cycle of violence? How many more communities must endure this unbearable pain? We owe it to the victims, their families, and ourselves to find solutions. Marshall County, Kentucky is a place where life moves at a slower pace. It's a tight-knit community where people know their neighbors and look out for one another. But on a cold January morning, that peace was shattered by the sound of gunfire. 15-year-old Gabe Parker, armed with a handgun, opened fire in the school's common area, a place typically bustling with students. Two young lives were tragically cut short that day. 18 others were injured, some critically, their futures forever altered. The small town, unaccustomed to, to such violence, struggled to comprehend the tragedy. Unlike many other school shooters, Parker had no history of disciplinary issues. He wasn't known to be bullied and outwardly seemed like a chemistry says, oisade, awadesai, stip beak, sky size, ela wadis, sennis, itchene, they is suas, chiasis, I. This left investigators in the community with a chilling question. Why? What drove this seemingly ordinary young man to commit such a horrific act? The search for answers in Marshall County continues. The community, forever marked by this tragedy, grapples with grief, anger, and a profound sense of loss. The hope is that by understanding what led to this shooting, we can prevent similar tragedies from occurring in the future. The halls of Oxford High School in Michigan became the scene of unimaginable horror in the fall of 2021. Ethan Crumbly, a 15-year-old student, carried out a planned attack on his classmates, forever changing the lives of countless families. Armed with a 9mm handgun purchased by his father just days before, Crumbly opened fire, killing four students and injuring seven others, including a teacher. The shooting sent shockwaves through the community, leaving many to question how such a tragedy could occur. But the investigation into the Oxford High School shooting revealed a disturbing series of events leading up to the attack. Crumbly had displayed increasingly disturbing behavior in, in the weeks prior, raising red flags with both teachers and his parents. Despite these warning signs, the gun remained easily accessible to Crumbly. The prosecutor in the case took the unusual step of charging both Crumbly's parents with involuntary manslaughter, alleging their negligence contributed to the tragedy. This case has ignited a national debate about parental responsibility when it comes to preventing gun violence. The small Christian university of Oikos in Oakland, California, became the scene of a horrific act of violence on April 2nd, 2012. It was a day that began like any other, students going about their daily routines, attending classes, and enjoying the spring weather. But for one El Go, a former student at the university, this day held a much darker purpose. 
Go had been expelled from Oikos University, reportedly for behavioral issues. Sources say he held deep-seated grievances against the administration and some of the students. He'd been nursing these resentments, and on that fateful day in April, he decided to act on them in a tragically violent way. Armed and prepared, Go entered the university grounds, his anger and resentment boiling over. His target, a classroom full of unsuspecting nursing students. He opened fire, unleashing a barrage of bullets, forever shattering the tranquility of the campus and leaving a trail of devastation in his wake. Seven innocent lives were lost that day, their futures tragically cut short by an act of senseless violence. The Oikos University shooting highlights the profound impact that mental health can have on individuals in our communities. June 7, 2013, another seemingly ordinary day shattered by the eruption of gun violence. This time, the idyllic Southern California city of Santa Monica was the setting, the location, Santa Monica College. John Zawari, a 23-year-old with a documented history of mental illness, embarked on a terrifying rampage that would leave a community in mourning. Zawari's deadly journey began at his father's home, where he fatally shot both his father and a brother. He then set fire to the house, a chilling prelude to the violence that was to come. Armed with multiple firearms and a considerable amount of ammunition, he made his way to Santa Monica College. His path of destruction led him onto the college campus, where he indiscriminately opened fire, students scattering in terror. Five innocent people lost their lives that day, their dreams and futures extinguished in a hail of bullets. The rampage finally came to an end in the college library, where Zawari was killed in a shootout with police. The Santa Monica College shooting sent shockwaves through the community and beyond, raising difficult questions about mental health care, gun control, and the role of law enforcement in preventing such tragedies. The victims and their families are left to grapple with the devastating aftermath of that day, forever marked by the senseless loss inflicted upon them. September 13th, 2017, the quiet halls of Freeman High School in Rockford, Washington, were shattered by the echo of gunfire, the terrifying sound that has become all too familiar in schools across America. The shooter, 15-year-old Caleb Shop, had a morbid fascination with previous school shootings, a fascination that spiraled into a horrifying reality. Shop had reportedly been exhibiting warning signs, a preoccupation with violence and previous school shootings. He'd even talked about carrying out an attack himself. Tragically, these warning signs went unheeded, and on that September morning, he brought his dark obsession to his own school. Armed with weapons taken from home, Sharp entered the school with a terrifying plan in mind. He opened fire in the hallway, fatally shooting one student, a classmate who bravely confronted him. The rampage could have been far worse, but Sharp was disarmed and apprehended. The Freeman High School shooting highlights the critical importance of recognizing and addressing warning signs. It emphasizes that mental health issues, especially when combined with access to firearms, can have devastating and far-reaching consequences. The small town of Great Mills, Maryland became the site of yet another tragic school shooting on March 20th, 2018. It's a day that will forever be etched in the memories of this community, a stark reminder of the violence that continues to plague our schools. This time, the tragedy unfolded at Great Mills High School. It was just before eight o'clock in the morning, the school day beginning like any other, when 17-year-old Austin Wyatt Rollins entered the school building armed with a handgun. Rollins, a student at Great Mills, targeted a specific individual that morning, a 16-year-old classmate, Jalen Willie, with whom he had a prior romantic relationship. 
These tragedies often stem from personal conflicts amplified by access to firearms. Rollins shot Jalen in a hallway, critically injuring her. He then exchanged fire with the school resource officer, Blaine Gaskell, who responded bravely to the sound of gunshots. During the exchange, Rollins fatally shot himself while also injuring another student, 14-year-old Desmond Barnes. This incident, though tragically ending in the loss of young lives, also highlighted the critical role of armed school resource officers. Officer Gaskill's quick response undoubtedly prevented further bloodshed. Jalen Willie tragically was pronounced brain dead and taken off life support two days later. Her death shook uh, the community, shook the community to its core, leaving many questioning how such a uh, um, a senseless act of violence could occur. The shooting at Great Mills High School once again forced the nation to confront the complex issues surrounding gun violence, school safety, and the devastating impact of teen relationship violence. It's a conversation that continues to this day as we grapple with how to prevent these tragedies from happening again. This case, like so many others, emphasizes the importance of recognizing warning signs, addressing mental health concerns, and promoting responsible gun ownership. It's a multifaceted issue that demands our attention and action. The serene image of suburban Colorado was shattered on May 7, 2019. It was a day like any other at the STEM School Highlands Ranch, students going about their day, teachers preparing lessons when the unthinkable happened. Two students, Devin Erickson, 18, and Alec McKinney, 16, entered the school with a terrifying plan. Armed and ready, they opened fire, turning a place of learning into a scene of chaos and terror. One student, Kendrick Castillo, lost his life in the shooting, a tragic, reminder of the human cost of gun violence. Several others were injured, their lives forever marked by the events of that day. This wasn't just another, another school shooting, this was a community ripped apart. Parents rushed to the school, frantic with worry, desperate to find their children safe. The image of those parents, their faces etched with fear and uncertainty, is a haunting reminder of the very real consequences of these tragedies. The community of Highlands Ranch, much like those before them, was left to grapple with the question of how this could happen here. In the aftermath of the shooting, details emerged about the alleged motives of the shooters. Erickson and McKinney were reportedly targeting specific students who they claimed had bullied them. This act of targeted violence, fueled by anger and resentment, shook the community to, to, shoot near to its core. It forced a, um, a conversation about the pervasive nature of bullying and the devastating impact it can have. The shooting at, you know, at STEM School Highlands Ranch wasn't just about gun laws, it was about the very fabric of our society and the responsibility we have to one another. The investigation revealed a complex web of factors that contributed to the shooting. Erickson, it was learned, had a history of mental health issues and had even expressed admiration for the Columbine shooters. McKinney, on the other hand, had a troubled home life and a history of run-ins with the law. This tragic event highlighted the challenges in understanding the root causes of gun violence. It's a complicated issue with no single solution and it demands our continued attention and unwavering commitment to finding a better way forward. September 4th, 2024 marked another dark day in American history, this time in the quiet town of Gainesville, Georgia. At Appalachie High School, the day began like any other, but for a 14-year-old student, it was a day for a horrifying plan to unfold. Armed with a rifle, a gift from his father, the student walked into the school and unleashed a torrent of violence, forever altering the lives of those present. 
Four innocent lives were cut short that day, their futures stolen in an, in an act of senseless violence. The hallways of Appalachie High School, meant to be filled with the sounds of learning and laughter, echoed instead with the sound of gunshots. Um, the tragedy at Appalachie High School was not just about the actions of a troubled teenager. It exposed a deeply disturbing aspect of this case, the role of the shooter's father. The student's father, Jeffrey Gray, was charged for his involvement in the shooting, accused of providing the firearm used in the attack. This chilling detail sent shockwaves through the community and beyond raising questions about parental responsibility and the easy access to firearms. The thought that a parent could play a role, however indirect, in such a horrific act was unfathomable to many. As the investigation unfolded, a clearer picture emerged of the student's troubled state. He was described by some as withdrawn and isolated, struggling to fit in. The rifle, a gift from his father, was reportedly something the student had long desired, a tragic symbol of a father's misplaced love and a son's descent into darkness. This case highlighted the need for open conversations about mental health, particularly within families, and the importance of recognizing warning signs before it's too late. It was a reminder that behind every school shooting, there's a complex story waiting to, waiting to be understood. The shooting at Appalachie High School left a community reeling, grappling with the aftermath of such a senseless act. The victims, their families, and the entire town were left to pick up the pieces, forever marked by the tragedy. This event, like so many before it, stresses the urgent need for comprehensive solutions to address gun violence in America. It's a call to action for lawmakers, educators, parents and communities to come together to create a safer future for our children. From the halls of Columbine High School to the classrooms of Sandy Hook Elementary, from the quiet suburbs of Parkland, Florida, to the rural towns of Oregon and Colorado, the devastating impact of school shootings has left an indelible mark on the American psyche. Over the past two decades, we've witnessed the unimaginable, the loss of innocent lives, the shattering of communities, the enduring trauma inflicted on survivors, families, and first responders. These are not just statistics, not just headlines. These are human beings, each with their own story, their own hopes and dreams, tragically cut short. These tragic events highlight the urgent need for addressing the root causes of gun violence in our society, we must confront the difficult conversations about mental health, access to firearms, bullying, and the glorification of violence in our culture. It's time to move beyond thoughts and prayers and take concrete steps towards meaningful change. We owe it to the victims, their families, and future generations to create safer schools and communities. This is not a partisan issue. This is about protecting our children, our teachers, and our communities. It's about ensuring that every child feels safe and supported, that they can go to school without fear, and that they can focus on learning and growing. It's about fostering a culture of empathy, respect, and responsibility. Let us honor the memories of those we've lost by working together to prevent future tragedies. Let us be the generation that finally breaks the cycle of violence and creates a brighter future for all. The time for action is now.